Our passage for today is Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 to 21. Sarah's going to read them for us. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the twenty-fourth day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left, my face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you, and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up, trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, because I was detained there with thinking of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground, and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed, he said. Peace. Be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. What's going on with the world? Is that a question you've asked yourself recently? Often it seems like the world is out of control. What will happen next? Who can guess? But sometimes it seems like the world is being controlled by powerful people. They get what they want. The rules don't apply to them. But they get to say what the rules should be for everyone else. Or we might get the feeling that the world is being controlled by evil forces. It can seem like there is something bigger at work behind the individuals and organisations that are out there trying to achieve their agenda. Is there something connecting and empowering the bad influences in our world? The fact is our understanding of the world is very limited. It's true, we know much more information about our world than any other time in history. But what we know is limited to what we can see and what we experience and what we learn from other people. In a way, we can't see the whole forest because all we can see are the individual trees. But there's a different perspective on our world. In the Bible, God speaks the truth to us about ourselves and the universe we live in. 
And his perception is not limited like ours is. And his understanding is complete and perfect. Not only because he is the truth, but because he is the creator of everything, seen and unseen. Daniel learned that over 70 years through a series of visions that we've been looking at here in the book that bears his name. In chapter 2, God gave him the interpretation of the king's dream, a statue representing successive powerful empires, which is destroyed by a rock representing God's kingdom. In chapter 7, God showed Daniel the very same kingdoms, but this time looking like mighty beasts. But they were all held to account by the Ancient of Days. In chapter 8, God showed Daniel the last two of these kingdoms as a ram and a goat, fighting it out for power. And in chapter 9, God spoke again. Daniel was praying because of those dreams and because of God's promises to restore his people from exile in Babylon. And there, God promised an even greater deliverance in response to Daniel's prayer. Jesus, God's anointed one, would be put to death to put an end to sin and its consequences. Now, each of those dreams and visions zooms in on the previous one. Each one gets more detailed and more realistic. And here, in one final epic vision, God focuses even more on that third kingdom in chapters 10 to 12 of Daniel. And instead of unimaginable beasts, God shows Daniel explicitly the future actions of human kings and human kingdoms and shows him that they are all under God's control. But even before we get there, there's a bigger question to answer. Is God in control at all? And if he is, what does that mean for us? Well, what God will show us here in Daniel chapter 10 is that we cannot understand our world without understanding God and how he rules. As God tells us in Daniel 10, it's impossible to understand our world looking exclusively at the human influences that are at play. What happens here is intimately connected to what happens in the spiritual world that we cannot see. Understanding that could leave us trembling. It might seem that our world is controlled or at least influenced by evil forces that we can't see. But what God shows us in Daniel chapter 10 is that he is in control of the spiritual world too. And he is the one that we should turn to for help. And if we are Christians, we have the privilege of speaking directly to God, wherever we are, and whatever's going on in our world that we can see, or the spiritual world that we can't. So the first question to ask here in Daniel chapter 10 is, why should we pray? Well, Daniel shows us one very good reason to pray, and we saw it in chapter 9. Here it is again in verses 1 to 3. Be concerned for God's people. Notice here, Daniel gives us a theological reason to be concerned for God's people. That is, a reason based on who God is. See, what people think about God is influenced by what they think about God's people. We saw that in Daniel chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. So when we pray for God's people, it should be like Daniel, because we bear God's name. And what people think of us will influence what they think of him. Daniel records for us events three years after those he wrote down in chapter 9. He tells us in verse 1 that it was in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that these events occurred. Now that Cyrus is probably just a different name for Darius, who we met 
at the end of chapter 8 and the start of chapter 9. That would make this the year 536 BC. Cyrus was a Persian and the head of a new empire. And so he had a completely different approach to exiled people in his empire than the Babylonians had had. In the first year of his reign, we read in Ezra chapter 1, he announced that the Jews could return to Israel and rebuild the temple there. But notice, Daniel is still in exile. And we know that because he's still referred to by his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, in verse 1. And he tells us that he is by the Tigris River, in verse 4. But even for the Jews who did return to Jerusalem, things were not going well. Opposition quickly arose to rebuilding the temple and the walls so necessary for their protection. And history tells us that at this point, the third year of his reign, Cyrus left his son Cambyses in charge. And that son issued a decree forbidding the building of the temple. Well, amongst all of this, God was pleased to reveal a message to Daniel in verse 1. But notice, it might not be the message of reassurance we were hoping for. It's about a great war. And the interpretation of that message comes in the vision recorded here in verses 10, uh, or chapters 10 to 12. So, of course, Daniel was concerned for God's people. And notice here what he does about it. In verse 2, he mourns for three weeks. That's despite the fact that in the very next verse, verse 4, he tells us that this all happened on the 24th day of the first month. Of the three weeks of mourning and praying that Daniel went through, I covered that time when the Israelites were so supposed to celebrate at the time when they remembered God's salvation from Egypt as he brought them out at the Passover. But Daniel knew that the situation called for fasting and not feasting. Well, is that how we respond to the trouble that comes to God's people? When trouble is being stirred up outside or inside the church, what do we do? Maybe we do nothing. Do we look for better ways for the church to be successful and strong? Or do we do what Daniel did? Do we fast and pray? Do we call upon the Lord of the church and the Lord of history to honour his name among his people? The writer Ian Bounds wrote, While the church is looking for better methods, God is looking for better men, for people are God's methods. Well, we have good reason to be concerned for God's people. How people think about Jesus' people tells us a lot about what they think of Jesus. So are we, as a church, concerned for our reputation? Are we concerned for our spiritual health? Well, God is in control of the world. And so when we pray to God for the good of his people, how will we feel when he answers? Daniel shows us here in verses 4 to 9, we'll be overwhelmed by God's glory. See what Daniel tells us here about hearing God's message. It reveals God's glory it can isolate us, and it should overwhelm us. Daniel describes being near the Tigris River and seeing what looks like a man, in verses 4 to 6. But he's not a man like we know. He's finely dressed in linen with a gold belt. His body shines like a gemstone, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, and his arms and legs are glowing like polished bronze. Then when he speaks, it's like a massive crowd all saying the same thing at once. 
So who is this? Frankly, I don't know. Uh, it's certainly no ordinary human being. And it's tempting to jump to Revelation chapter 1, where Jesus is described in similar terms. But what we read a little bit later about him needing help because of the resistance from the prince of the Persian kingdom in verse 13, that just doesn't seem to fit with it being Jesus. What is clear is that this is a spiritual being sent by God for the good of God's people. And that's the definition of an angel in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? But even so, if this is the glory of one of God's messengers, shouldn't we be overwhelmed with the Lord who sends them? As Hebrews 12 verse 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. What stunning glory. He has. We might think that if there really is a God out there and he communicated to us, everyone would want to hear about it. But see what happens to the people with Daniel as this message comes. They don't see the vision, but they are overwhelmed by terror. So they run and hide in verses 7 and 8. Not everyone will listen to God. In fact, not everyone can listen to him. To some people, the message about Jesus smells like death, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. But to others, it brings life. Jesus himself said, Do you think that I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you but division. Luke 12, 51. So speaking and hearing God's message can and will divide. And like Daniel, we may seem to be all alone. And yet, the angel's message proves that Daniel is never alone. As soon as he prays, he is heard, and the answer is on its way, like verse 12 says. When hearing and following Jesus costs us friends and family relationships, we're going to need to remember that. Our prayers are heard and God answers. Hearing God reveal his glory through his word can have a dramatic effect on our relationships. But we should be more concerned about the effect it's meant to have on us. And Daniel doesn't just uh, sit there with his arms folded as his friends run away. Now notice what it says in verses 8 and 9. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Later, Daniel gains some strength, but he's still trembling in verse 11. And he cannot keep standing, but he bows down with his face to the ground, speechless in verse 15. And in verse 17, he can hardly breathe. This is what happens when we really hear from God. We realize that we are weak and unworthy to speak. If you don't believe that, think of Adam and Eve's response to God after they ate the forbidden fruit. They hid. Or at Mount Sinai, when God gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites, they wanted Moses to go up the mountain and speak with God, because if they continued to hear him speaking, they said, we will die. And when Isaiah saw the Lord in his holy glory, he said, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Oh, but that's the Old Testament, I hear you say. 
Isn't it different now that Jesus has come? Well, let one of Jesus' closest friends, the disciple John, give you the answer. In Revelation chapter 1, he says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Is that what you experience when God speaks to you? When we seek God's glory and the good of his people through prayer, and God responds by revealing himself through his word, we should be overwhelmed. I know I am. How amazing it is that the Holy One who is Lord of all and knows everything, knows everyone, would love me and give his Son for me as is described in Romans 8, 32. American writer David Helm says this, The prophetic office is not for everyone, and for those to whom it came, it did so with a cost. Uh, we wrongly think that these men of God, greatly used by God, had the best jobs in terms of ease and intimacy with God. Not so. Hearing the word of God was an almost unbearable experience. He points us to Genesis 3 and Exodus 20 for confirmation. Passing on the word of God was often a dangerous or difficult experience. And the gospel that has come to us has come by and still comes by proclamation. A proclamation that is often costly and therefore all the more to be cherished. Helm continues, while this text does not necessarily demand particular applications related to the prophetic office, it does show us something about it. We ought to be thankful for the prophetic office, that God has revealed himself through his word and given proclaimers of it to the church throughout the ages. It is good that we pray for and encourage those among us who are called to preach the gospel. What do you expect when you receive God's word? Do you expect God to reveal his glory, to isolate you from the unbelieving world and to overwhelm you by showing you himself? Or do you just expect it to feel really good? Well, when the God who controls the world answers our prayers, we will be overwhelmed as he reveals himself to us through his word and in his glory. But what should we do after we pray? As Daniel shows us in verses 10 to 21, we should be confident in God's love. As concerned as we should be for God's people, and as overwhelming as God's glory can be, we can still be certain of God's love. And so, because of his love, we'll listen and understand and be strengthened and we'll know the truth. Verses 10 to 12 show us that we'll listen because God listens to us and sends his message to his people. That's extraordinary. But maybe we take it for granted. Maybe we've been praying for so long that we forget that. Or maybe our lives show that we don't actually believe it. We don't pray, or not very much, because we don't think that it actually does anything. But listen to what Daniel was told here in verses 10 to 12. He gives us the context. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you. And stand up, for I have now been sent to you. 
And when he said this to me, I stood up, trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Even though Daniel was weak and mourning, God answered his prayer. Why? Not because of some power in Daniel. No, as James 5 verse 16 says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Theologian Sinclair Ferguson comments, With God there can be no distinction between the way we pray and the way we live. Prayer is not a piece of magic, a secret trick that we can use because we have a special knowledge, irrespective of our manner of life. The only prayer that is powerful in its lasting effect is the expression of the life and desires of a righteous individual who walks in covenant fellowship with God. See, when we pray, trusting that God will answer, not because we have found the best way to pray, but for his glory, we can be sure that he always hears and he always answers in the best possible way. Well, how can we be sure? As verses 12 to 14 point out, we can be sure when we understand that the future is determined by God. Well, how could the angel claim to tell Daniel, in verse 14, what will happen to your people in the future? Well, that's only possible because God controls the future. Yes, it's true, and we see it in verse 13, that there is conflict about the future. Verse 13 describes the spiritual warfare that so often we don't even perceive. But that spiritual warfare should not be a surprise to us. The Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper wrote, If once the curtain were pulled back and the spiritual world behind it came to view, it would expose to our spiritual vision a struggle so intense, so convulsive, sweeping everything within its range, that the fiercest battle ever fought on earth would seem, by comparison, a mere game. Not here, but up there. That is where the real conflict is raged. Our earthly struggle drones in its backlash. How much we need the Lord to remind us of these spiritual realities. We need to hear what he says to us in Ephesians 6 verses 12 to 17. That our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers in this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. He tells us, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In verse 15, Daniel is once more on the ground. Knowing the spiritual warfare around him leaves him speechless. In verses 16 and 17, the angel makes him able to speak, but he barely feels that he should. Then he's given strength in verse 18. And what message helps Daniel to listen and to live by God's word? Well, we'll need strength to do that. 
and as verses 15 to 19 say, will be strengthened because God loves his people. It's certainly easy to live in ignorance of the spiritual war that's going on, but when we know and see its effects, we could easily crumble. But God gives us peace. He will make us strong. How? By calling us highly esteemed. By telling us that he loves us. And that love isn't just a warm feeling towards us. Love is an action. We always need to remember that. Love is sacrificing what we have for the good of someone else. And God loved his people in just that way. He gives his son to defeat Satan, to conquer death, and to bring us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the son he loves, as Colossians 1 verse 13 says. In verse 19, he's told, Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. Peace, be strong now, be strong. We've seen how, once we've prayed, we'll listen, understand, be strengthened, and also we'll know the truth, as verses 20 and 21 say. There, the angel explains to Daniel the reason he came to him. The spiritual conflict will continue, but he says in verse 21, First, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. What truth does the angel reveal? Well, the details are in chapters 11 and 12, and we'll have to look at them, which you can do between now and next Sunday. But this much is clear. God fights for his people. That is the unseen, spiritual, but very real reality that we thought of earlier. God fights for his people. Well, how and where does that fighting happen? Is it through mysterious ceremonies and mystically powerful words? No, the front line of the spiritual battle is in our minds. God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's how spiritual warfare is fought. James says that the fight comes down to our attitudes, pride or humility. How does God fight then? By giving his people grace so that we submit to him and resist the devil. That's how spiritual victories are won. We have our minds changed when we are concerned for God's people, overwhelmed by his glory and confident in his love. We will submit ourselves and our desires to him in prayer and in obedience. Why? Because God is in control of the world. He graciously hears and answers us. And his love is certain. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus, like Daniel, we are living in the middle of a war. And we can't see the spiritual warfare, but we can see its effects. And knowing that could leave us a crumpled heap on the floor like Daniel. But God's message to us is the same as it was to him. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. Peace, be strong now, be strong. So, like Daniel, let's learn to trust that God is in control and answers prayer for the good of his people and the glory of his name.
because of his great love given to us through faith in Jesus. Well, let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the Lord and ruler of all things, and yet you hear our prayer. And here in the scriptures, you assure us that when we pray in faith, you will answer us. You'll do it for the good of your people and for the glory of your name. And so it won't always be how we expect it. But we have seen that you always answer us according to your great love, which you have given to us in the Lord Jesus. And so when we don't know why things are happening the way they are, out there in the world and in our own lives. May we be confident of your love and know your peace and receive the strength that you can give us when we come asking in faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. In our uncertain world, we need God's words of assurance and blessing for us. And today they come to us from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.